Well, while we're waiting on the technology, let me say good morning. Uh, like Alexandra, uh, I come before you, and I'm not sure I'm a real scientist, because after all, everyone knows that a physicist is a fallen chemist. <laughs> and we seem to be making some progress. Ah, here we go, except that I'm not sure why that moved. There we go. Well, good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank the organizers, especially Katie, for reaching out and uh, bringing me to this group. Uh, I uh, am a mathematical physicist in my first career. Uh, I'm in my 41st year of teaching in my second career. Or maybe I've got the order reversed there. Uh, I uh, think about policy a lot these days, and it's in this last guise that I've been invited to speak to you. So. Uh, for the, since uh, 2009, I've been serving on the U.S. President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and PCAS, uh, as the, the acronym goes for the group, uh, has written two reports on STEM education. Uh, these two reports, well, these two reports are Prepare and Inspire, which is really directed towards K through 12 STEM education, and our second such effort. Uh, engage to excel, which I think is far more relevant to discuss with this group this morning. So I'm going to focus my comments about what we were finding in those reports. I must admit it was very interesting hearing the uh, comments that Alexander made, as well as some of the pushback that came from this audience uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, PCAS does lots and lots of reports, and one of our most recent reports was on the health of the U.S. Uh, S&T enterprise. And like many of you in the audience, uh, we are quite alarmed uh, because we are also looking prospectively as opposed to retrospectively, and the trends are, in fact, frightening. Uh, some of the things that we have found evidence for is indeed the way that the country invests in science has changed dramatically so that uh, the uh, fraction of uh, research that goes on in the country has fallen to about 3% level. Um, which uh, is middling when you look at the world. There are countries who do a little bit better than we do, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, the thing that's really frightening is the sort of the tie-in to exactly the kinds of questions I heard for the last two or three questioners. That is, how do you tie it back to the innovation cycle and then ultimately the impact on the economy? And in, in that part of the ecosystem, we found lots and lots of signs to worry the balance, for example, between high-risk and high-benefit research is at a, at a level we think is sub-optimal sub, um, for the country. Uh, we've laid out, in fact, in our most recent report, uh, which I'm speaking uh, on the health of the S&T enterprise, we've actually laid out a set of metrics that agencies might begin to use to think about how they fund research. And one of them is indeed to look at what's uh, more innovative as opposed to what's more incremental. Both are necessary, but absolutely, there, you know, there's some portfolio balancing that we've in, uh, encouraged to go on in the agencies and among the agency heads and uh, certainly uh, as they speak to the, the Congress and uh, the administration. So I would advise those of you who uh, might have more of an interest in that to look at our PCAST report on the health of the S&T enterprise. As I said, that is our most recent large report if you'll just Google PCAST and health and s and I'm sure you'll find uh, the report. All PCAST reports are available to the public. Okay, so as I said, today what I really want to concentrate on was uh, a STEM ed and I, how, how I think that's sort of cross-cutting with this group, uh, particularly as I've heard some of the numbers today. So first of all, let me go back and, so who is PCAST? Well, we're a group of uh, civilians, I'd like to remind people. We are not part of the administration. We are so special, we have a title that's special. We're called Special Government Employees. And accompanying that great title is a great salary of zero dollars per hour. <laughs> um, so it's done out of dedication and uh, a feeling that uh, it's a patriotic calling to try to do your best for the country, as I'm sure many of you in this room feel that and at the end of the day, uh, we're all citizens of this great country. We've gotten so much from her, we certainly owe a great debt and need to to continue to have that kind of dream go forward for the future. So there are 20 of us. I could go through a list of names, and I will shortly have a show you a slide, but let me just say we're principally academics, but not exclusively academics. Uh, Eric Schmidt of Google is a member of PCAS. Craig Mundy of Microsoft is a member of PCAS. David Shaw, uh, who is uh, the inventor of Shaw Associates and uh, 
a billionaire made his money on Wall Street by showing those folks how mathematics is relevant to what they do at the bottom line. Uh, Eric Lander, uh, the leader of the Broad Institute, uh, recently a Milner Prize recipient. So we're mixed, we're mostly academics, but I think that the thing that binds us all is this idea that uh, this administration has a fundamental belief that science can be called to the service to benefit our entire society. And calling in a way that, quite frankly, I don't think we've been called in a, in a long time. So, who's on PCAST? As I said, I've named some of our members, and I'll be happy to discuss the full membership with anyone who wishes to know. It's all available online. But, so what is the problem? In our second report, in fact, I'd like to uh, change the focus again more to uh, uh, be in resonance of the comments I heard in the last few minutes. Um, is, uh, I mean, is, is the country underperforming in producing science? Well, you know, we looked at this question too, and I have to tell you that, like uh, Alexander, we couldn't quite make up our minds there. It's not completely clear that the country is underperforming in the production of scientists, per se. However, there are stark uh, signals that we are underperforming in a very interesting and peculiar way. And this centers around what we call a STEM-capable workforce. So what's that? Well, uh, this diagram here is sort of a, 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 an attempt to, to set out a chart to think about the American population. In red are kind of people like you folks. Uh, we're kind of the, we're trained in STEM, we work in STEM, uh, we're professionals in STEM. But then there's a cascading of other groups of citizens so that out in the blue you have people who aren't trained in STEM and don't have STEM jobs, but you can't say STEM doesn't touch them because almost all of those people, for example, are on Facebook and tech. And so STEM has leaked into their pockets when they weren't looking. Um, so there's a cascading of, of the skill levels in STEM, and the thing that we looked at, uh, which we found very interesting, is that the skill set that traditionally uh, is, that, is the one that's mastered by people in this room that skill set seems to be gaining in value more generally in our population in places that you might not expect it to. So one example of this, in fact, my favorite example of this is to talk about uh, what's going on in our economy like right now. I'm sure it's no uh, secret to anyone in this room that we are coming out of the most ca catastrophic economic conditions this country has seen in about 70 years. And we're still simply in recovery mode. Uh, there are somewhere between, depending on how you count, 30 million to 20, maybe even greater, millions of Americans who cannot find jobs. There are at least several hundred thousand and perhaps approaching a million jobs that cannot find Americans. And one of the things that's interesting about these jobs that can't find Americans is because it's the skill set that is the barrier. That is, the jobs require uh, skills and expertise, which typically employers are not able to find in a pool of applicants who are make, uh, trying, to find, uh, trying to get the jobs. And so it's on that basis that this report was written. So we're not about, the report is not about how to reproduce you folks more efficiently. The report is how, does the, how do the benefits from what we do in our everyday working life, how does that spur the American economy? How does that make for the possibility of the American dream to be extended to another generation. That's the focus of the report. And I should tell you that this uh, focus is uh, derived from the administration because, in fact, uh, although one hears lots of crazy things out uh, among the media and Vox Populi, uh, this is an administration that is severely focused on the economy and severely focused on making sure that Americans have the opportunity to uh, continue to experience the American dream as we have over the last hundred years or so. So let me talk about one of these trends, one of the ways that frightens us. Uh, on the question of underperformance, this is a piece of data that's a little bit uh, uh, dated. It's um, from 2008, but if you ask the degree of uh, uh, college uh, completion among Americans, we're about third as of 2008 behind uh, Canada and Japan. And this is in the age groups of 25 to 64, but if you look at the age groups 25 to 34, we dropped to number nine. Now this tells us something rather interesting about the American workforce right now, that the current youngest generation of Americans in uh, uh, the workforce are technically less well educated than the generation in front of them. This is the first time in over 100 years this statement could be made. 
uh, we can, you know, predicting the future, of course, is, uh, is uh, beset with uh, harrowing uh, difficulty. Uh, most of us who try to do it end up with egg on our face, but we have to project to plan. And as I guess it was General Eisenhower said, planning, uh, the plans themselves may be rather useless, paraphrasing, but the planning process itself is essential. So we have to plan for the future. And one of the things that we do is look at projections that come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And uh, you can, they have codes for various types of jobs, and they can make projections on the country's needs as we move into the next decade or so. And this data is available generally. And there's a, there is a, uh, a faculty member at Georgetown, uh, Anthony Carnavali, who basically is one of the country's experts in trying to look at econ economic data and trying to figure out where the economy is going, what opportunities are out there. And he has this report called The Undereducated American, which I advise scientists to look at. It's not so much about us. It's about the folks that we work for, the public. But I heard the, the comment about wage premium on college degrees uh, in the last talk. That's something we looked at. And indeed, uh, it's a very interesting curve that you can also find plotted in Mr. Carvalho's report called The Undereducated American. And one of the interesting things about it is that we are in a period where the wage premium on a college degree is increasing and increasing rather dramatically. Now, what that means is that uh, wage premium is, is a measurement, it's not a prediction. It means that what you are looking at is what American industry is willing to pay a worker with a particular qualification. And we think business is rational, so we don't believe that businesses are, are out of the goodness of their heart overpaying Americans for skills that they don't need. They see a need of it. We think that's what's driving this increase in the wage premium. Um, what in this, as I said, for the scientists, well, we looked at in, in our reports, uh, this report also, and you can see that there's a variation and there's a very variegated uh, uh, domain of uh, job opportunities with both uh, issues of replacement and uh, new uh, positions. So, uh, for example, the mathematical and physical sciences, uh, mathematical sciences, which uh, I, I have a hard time deciding which I am because as a theoretical physicist, I actually just do mathematics. I, I'm really useless as a physicist. Uh, so the um, uh, projection, projections over the next dec uh, decade or so is that there'll be a 33% need for, 34% 30, uh, need for replacement, and maybe a 23% need for new people coming into the field. As I said, it varies. Uh, the greatest needs are going to be in computer science and uh, computer specialists with a 620% need for replacement because there's a whole generation of folks who are trained on Fortran who are going to get out of the business quite soon. And uh, yet the needs of the, of the country in uh, that skill set are going to be enormous. And in a similar manner, we can see even more projections with the growth of online and uh, Facebook and all of the cyber developments in the economy, uh, there's clearly going to be a great need for people with that skill set. Uh, life and uh, physical sciences, life, physical, and social sciences, again, we're going to see a larger need for replacement with a, a turnover in the workforce and some opportunity for new people to get in. And then physical sciences, which is this group, again, we face uh, the same kind of demographic bomb about to go out go off. Uh, we see opportunities for replacement as well as opportunities for growth. Now, the other thing in our study that was kind of obvious is that uh, it's very varied by discipline. So, for example, in the biological uh, sciences, uh, there are signs, in fact, that we may be overproducing people trained in the biological sciences. So you look at the, the rate at which people get their first independent grant, which I heard mentioned earlier. You look at what happens to the young people who start off in biology and get parked into essentially uh, short-term or postdoctoral training for decades, suggests that, uh, you know, we could probably throttle back there and not hurt the country's productivity. In other areas, such as in computer science, we, we see a, a dearth of people that are there. So that's the background of our report. Our report is really a report not about this group, but about what we think is important for the country's economy. However, it cross-cuts with the, exactly the question that this workshop is on, namely, what shall we do in undergraduate training as we move into the next decade or so? So our report, as I said, is entitled Engage to Excel. It, it stem in the service of the economy and the American dream, and that's the proper way to think about it. Uh, PCAST is not a debating society. Uh, there are 20 of us, and people think that we sit around in a closed room and go off and think deep thoughts and come out with profound sayings. We do have conceits, however. We have one conceit is that our reports are not 
beautiful shelf ornamentation, but in fact are action plans and guides for what might be, to, might be done by the federal uh, government to face the challenges that we are, we are, are presented. So this is a group, uh, slide just kind of showing the names of people who actually worked on our STEM ed report. So what do we see? Well, fewer than 40% of students who enter college intending to major in STEM uh, actually complete the degree. Uh, higher performing students frequently cite uninspiring introductory courses as the reason they drop out. Low performing students, but with high interest and some aptitude uh, in STEM, face difficulty in introductory courses. Many students cite an unwelcoming atmosphere with faculty teaching STEM courses as a reason for their departure. And women and members of minorities now constitute approximately 70% of the student body, but own only 45% of STEM degrees. And in fact, they represent an underrepresented majority. So in this report, the first thing we did was PCAST reports are all data driven. So we try to go out and find the best data on any particular area. Then we go out and talk to the experts. I told you we're not a debating society. What PCAST actually does is to go and interact with expert societies in other parts of either academia or the corporate world or wherever we can find them uh, in the country to address a particular question. So we go to people who are experts in neuroscience. We go to people who are experts in pedagogy and learning. And we ask, we present this data and have discussion with them and say, well, the data says, what can we do, for example, to prove the first two years of STEM education in college? And this, of course, is a question before you, in a sense. Well, what do we do about providing students, uh, students with tools uh, to excel? Uh, can we diversify STEM pathways? And this last one is a big one, because we seem to be moving into a, a period in which the economy is going to generate jobs that are not like the ones that you and I had, when you won't see people with 20, 30, and 40 year long careers at a single uh, institution uh, continuing to be employed gainfully, but in fact it looks like it's a period of a lot of churning. And if that's the case, and if STEM is going to be one of the undergirding factors in driving our economy, it means that STEM people, people trained with one set of STEM skills, will have to face the challenge of being retrained at some point in mid-career. So this whole issue about diversifying pathways is huge. It gets us a little bit out of our comfort zones because we've always thought about this as a pipeline. You know, you get started at one end, you just keep going along and trundle, and then out the other end you come. Uh, this is probably not the right model for what the country is going to need in the, in the future. We're probably going to need something with multiple on-ramps and off-ramps for people to get in and out of STEM training. And again, I, I emphasize we're not talking about PhD necessarily level training. We're talking about the training that will allow the innovation that comes from groups like this to be successfully harnessed in the innovation cycle of our economy. So our recommendations were aimed at fixing some of these problems. Uh, we uh, looked whether there were tools and examples out there of things that might be brought to scale to have an impact. And by the way, uh, the main problem, well, within a decade, the country's going to need about a hundred, uh, sorry, about a million more STEM capable workers than we're currently training. That's the problem that we're trying, we were facing. So what are the, some of the tools? Well, there's a, actually a new science of learning that most of us don't know very much about. It's been evolving for about the last 15 or 20 years, and part of what our document uh, does is for any scientist or faculty member who has an interest in, lear in learning about the learning of science, we provide a, what we hope is a one-stop shopping center where you can go and become much more familiar with what people know about how people learn, learn the skill set that we're engaged in uh, as professors in uh, disseminating among our students. Uh, there's a whole array of new technologies out there, new pedagogies, and we describe some of them in our report. This recommendation uh, is really going to be a challenge for faculty. Uh, more than anything else, I, I think one of the messages in our reports is uh, to paraphrase a very famous statement by a very well-known philosopher known as Pogo, we have met the enemy and he is us. And in some sense, that's part of the message of our report, is that all of you, and I'm certainly in this crew too, you know, we're the ones who made it through the system just like it was. It was, it was actually perfect for us. We persevered, we achieved, we became accomplished, we contributed in the system as it was. And yet, the um, system is failing large numbers of people. So we have to find ways in which to, to, to change that. So one of the things that uh, 
was rather surprising is if we, we don't have to jump over the moon in order to deal with this problem. If we can move the needle just a little bit, we can treat this problem of uh, economic need that the country will have. Um, there's something called evidence-based learning. And for a group like you, data matters. I mean, scientists are people who believe in data. So there is data about what constitutes effective teaching uh, practices. This data is available. We want people like you to become engaged in this data because, you know, we all are eloquent and beautiful speakers and wonderful uh, artists that we write at the blackboard, but many of our students are unable to see that. And so what is it that we can do in order to engage them? Well, evidence-based learning practices brings to folks like you an array of practices that have been in some sense field tested that seem to move the needle in terms of reaching more students. Um, we want to, we suggested that one of the big problems that we faculty will face is really a change in our culture. There's kind of a, and changing culture is one of the most difficult things that you can uh, ever attempt to do. It's going to have to be done for many different ways, and that's what we propose in this report is a multi-pronged approach. We want to have faculty, and especially our young faculty, aware that this evidence-based learning technology is out there and that they ought to become familiar with it to change their practices. We want mid-career and maybe even late-career folks like me to be willing to look at some of these new changes and maybe adopt and adapt some of them for our teaching uh, purposes. Um, we're going to need to have, you know, there's a financial uh, potential barrier in the way because whenever you want to talk about change, you know, if you're going along pretty well, and most of you, I suspect, are doing pretty well, and then someone comes along and says, but you can do better, your first question is, what's, how, what's it going to cost me? You're going to either cost you in time, it's either going to cost you in money, it's going to cost you something. So uh, the federal government, we believe, ought to be willing to step up to the plate and ameliorate some of that cost. Some of that in terms of restructuring the physical environment, which teaching is actually occurring. Some of it in training for the kind of evidence-based practices that seem to work uh, out there for not for our best students, but maybe for our students that are just under our best because we need more of those people now, more than we needed in the past. So we, we uh, talk about grants that might get this accomplished. STEM institutional transformation grants, which would be large uh, department, uh, department size and larger grants made to universities to think about trying to become engaged in this, uh, these sorts of transformation. Metrics are sorely needed. You know, we have metrics, we talk about metrics all the time, but we need metrics uh, in terms of transparency. So, um, so I'm a professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, if someone came, a parent comes to me and says, if my kid comes to you and gets a uh, degree from the University of Maryland, how does that compare with a degree from Johns Hopkins? How do I answer that question? Right? I mean, this is, in some sense, the most fundamental question a parent is going to ask you. So we need metrics, and we need to be thinking about benchmarking ourselves along these lines. Now, this is not what we normally think about because for people like me, the rewards, of course, are, gee, I want that next great paper out there. Maybe in the back of my mind, I'm dreaming about the Nobel Prize, but I would never admit that, right? It's the sort of thing that drives us is the doing of the work of science, hopefully with the joy of discovery, because that's, I think, what drives most of us who become scientists. That's really our coin of the, coin of the realm. That's the thing that we wake up in the morning and think about. Recommendation two, uh, we want to look at uh, replacing standard laboratory practices with discovery-based learning. And again, that's a technique and a technology that uh, we try to uh, present in our report so that you can access it. Uh, there are experiments on this uh, laboratory-based classes. Uh, one that's a fairly successful one in, is at the University of Texas, Austin, 600 freshmen a year. And they have shown results that if you get students engaged in research early, and by the way, someone mentioned internships out here. When we say, uh, when we say research, it doesn't have to just be university-based research. The idea is get the students closer to the real-world problems because that will drive the excitement that will allow the students to persist. Uh, recommendation two is, re, uh, as I said, we, I'm sorry, this is a, simply uh, an elaboration where we talk about the kind of collaborations between universities and small colleges, also outside of the colleges. Recommendation three, mathematics is a big issue. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, interact with 
uh, freshmen uh, who are not STEM majors, but if you do, you might be surprised at what's going on in terms of what's happening for young people in, in mathematics education in secondary school. It is appalling to people like me. Uh, the, for example, when a, a very simple example which I recently confronted is uh, if I give you the product of x plus y times z plus w, for most of us we can do this without thinking. Well now, in middle school, there is this thing called foil, foiling, which probably most of you have never heard of. But it's the way that teachers teach students how to do that multiplication that we do by second nature. And what be benefit does it have? None that I can find. Because students don't know how, to, they know the word, they don't know what it means. So you replace the learning of a process with the learning of a word. It doesn't move the ball or the needle forward and then becoming better. So mathematics is something we think we have to confront directly as an issue. We're trying to get the leading mathematical societies to take ownership of this. The AMS, uh, American Mathematical Society, is our most prominent in some ways society. They have been relatively unengaged in this. The MAA, which is another organization, has been more engaged. But we want to have all of our leading mathematician, mathematical societies thinking about this problem. So we've made a call to try to get them to do this. There's evidence that uh, there's a group of students that if we can move this, we can treat this problem of having access to good jobs. Because there's a group of students that, are, that don't quite rate right at the qualified level, but they're just below. If we can move that group up, we'll have access to a lot more people to fulfill the needs of the country. Uh, this is a chart that actually shows that. Uh, you can ask, you can break students up into four groups, and I'm coming to my end shortly. You can break students up into four groups. Uh, students with high ability and high interest, and then the permutations of those, the low ability and low interest. And you can then set up a kind of a, a, a set of, a court, well, not quite quartiles because they aren't equal, but you find about 14% of uh, our students graduating from high school fall in the high interest, high ability. There's an additional 17% which have high math proficiency, I'm sorry, high math proficiency, high math ability, 17%, but low math proficiency and high STEM interest. And why high STEM interest? Well, that's the secret of the American culture. There's this thing out there called CSI. There are a lot of kids who watch those shows who think forensic science, God, what a great thing. They miss the part that the word science is in there. <laughs> and so then when they don't know that until they get to college, and then suddenly they're faced with, gee, I got to do that science stuff to do all that cool stuff that I see on TV. So these students start out motivated in the direction, but we have got to... So for these students, when you say they're not qualified, you can look at indicators on uh, various metrics like uh, SATs and what have you. And you can say, let's put a cutoff for highly rated, and, and now let's look at the group that's maybe five or ten per only ten to that. How large a group is that? turns out it's a substantial body. So if we can move the needle on that group, we can again, we think, treat this problem. Um, this is uh, more details about our, some of the prescriptions for treating this uh, and four, partnerships among stakeholders. This comes back to my point earlier about getting business involved, getting end users involved, because after all, this is not just about us, folks. It's not all about us. It's got to be about the country, this great country that, that we want to see continue into the future. And so we talk about a list of partnerships, the things that uh, some recommendations on changing a policy that government can make. And the entire report, as I said, is available to anyone who wishes to see it. Uh, all PCAS reports are available, and uh, I hope I've left enough, a sufficiency of time for some questions and hopefully interest you enough that you'll have some questions. Thank you.